We are very pleased to invite our next speaker, Ambassador Lincoln Bluefield Jr., former Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs and author of many books on the Iranian struggle for democracy and the opposition. Please welcome Ambassador Lincoln Bloomfield. Thank you all very much, and good afternoon. Thanks to the California Society for Democracy in Iran and to the Iranian-American community of Northern California. What an impressive turnout. It's an honor to share the podium with such distinguished presenters, and young and old, the speakers, our musicians. It's a great afternoon. We're all here today to send a message to the brave men and women standing for dignity, opportunity, and basic universal human rights in Iran. So let me begin by expressing my respect and support for the people of Iran and their righteous demand to be allowed to live in freedom. I came to Los Angeles from Washington, D.C., where everyone is talking about Iran. That's a good thing. We need to be talking about Iran. Believe me when I tell you, the regime in Tehran does not want Americans focusing on them. Because the more we focus on the clerical dictatorship in Tehran, the closer we look at how they managed to take over the country after the revolution and stay in power for 40 years, the more clearly Americans will understand the threat that this regime poses to everything America stands for. We'll see more clearly how this regime has hidden its crimes against the international community and against any Iranian who dissents from his or her rulers. We will realize that for many years, Washington has been fed a false history about Iran and those principled Iranians who stand for freedom and democratic government. I think you know what I'm talking about. Here in Los Angeles, we may be thousands of miles from Washington and many, many thousands of miles from Iran, but don't let that fool anyone. I'm guessing that many people in this hall have lived in Iran and experienced regime repression firsthand. I'm guessing that many of you have family members inside Iran who have to keep their heads down and their voices quiet to avoid a knock on the door and a trip to one of Iran's brutal prisons. I'm guessing that some people here in this hall today spent time at Camp Ashraf in Iraq after the exiled People's Mojahedin of Iran were expelled from France in 1986 in a corrupt hostage deal with the Ayatollahs in which France didn't get all of its hostages out of Lebanon. And I'm also guessing that some among the Iranian American communities here in California were directly victimized personally by the regime in Tehran, spending time in Iran's prisons as punishment for their political views and even suffering torture. I would expect that many of you have lost relatives and friends murdered in the torture chambers of Iran. Am I right? Yeah. My friends, I served for years in policy positions in the Pentagon, the White House, and the State Department. I saw the bombing of American embassies in Lebanon twice and the truck bombing of the Marine Barracks at Beirut Airport, killing 241 U.S. servicemen. I saw how the seizure of American hostages, the hijacking of a U.S. airliner, the murder of a U.S. officer serving in the United Nations, the mining of the Persian Gulf, and historic terror bombings and assassinations from Argentina to Germany, Geneva and Paris, and many other places marked this regime as the most dangerous and disruptive in the world. Decades later, what do we see? Iran was recently designated as the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism for the 35th year in a row. Today, 
This regime executes more of its own citizens per capita with no due process of law than any other country in the world. And we see one more very important feature. The people running this regime today are the same people who have been directly responsible for all of Iran's aggression and crimes through the years. One day soon, they need to be held accountable. I have a message for the, all the younger Iranian functionaries on the payroll of the Ministry of Justice or the Revolutionary Guards. Your bosses are guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. The people of Iran are demanding freedom. The sovereignty of Iran belongs to the people, not to the corrupt dictators who are using you to stay in power. The leaders are stealing from the people. Iran's airlines have reportedly been told to keep some seats empty in case the top officials need to flee the country. So to the younger revolutionary guards, prison guards, Basij, and bureaucrats, there's no seat for you on those airplanes. You need to put your guns down. You need to leave the keys in the prison cell door and walk away. You need to stand with the people of Iran, just as all of us here today are standing for the people of Iran. Now, since the U.S. drone strike on January 3rd that killed the Quds Force commander, Qasem Soleimani, officials and experts and media correspondents in Washington have been talking a lot about this man, just as we all have today. Americans are learning more about how Soleimani targeted U.S. soldiers in Iraq for many years, killing hundreds and wounding thousands of our brave servicemen and women. There's no doubt that the removal of Qasem Soleimani is very significant. His importance was not only in the area of terrorism and warfare, he was also a very effective political agent. Today, I want to make two policy recommendations, and I hope you all agree. The first recommendation is to look at what Soleimani was trying to accomplish in the region and make sure that we don't let the Tehran re regime succeed without him. The second recommendation <laughs> is to look at other top people in the Iran regime and point out their crimes as well. What was Soleimani's mission? He was carrying out Ayatollah Khomeini's revolutionary project to establish a Shia caliphate across to the Mediterranean Sea with the supreme leader at the top. That's why Iran built Hezbollah into a heavily armed non-state actor in Lebanon, falsely claiming to be a resistance group against Israel. And today, in the streets of Beirut, the people are demanding an end to, to Iran's destructive meddling and the corrupt elite that has allowed it to happen. Why did the Quds Force run to Bashar al-Assad's defense in Syria in 2011 when protesters were calling for democratic reform and an end to Assad's brutal repression? Soleimani organized Shia militias from all over the Middle East and helped the Syrian dictator bomb 11 million Syrians out of their homes with over half a million killed and over five million refugees fleeing their homeland. This is a massive war crime. And the Tehran regime did these things to keep the people of Syria from exercising their sovereign right to form a legitimate government. The United Nations Resolution 2254 still calls for a transition in Syria. That country will never be stable until Iran's grand plan is defeated once and for all. Which brings me to Iraq. <laughs> Soleimani directed three major mil militias in Iraq, as many of you know well. The Iraqi militia leader who was killed along with him a week ago, Abu Mahdi al-Mohandis, led Qatayb Hezbollah, the Iraqi Shia militia, behind many of the seven lethal attacks against the People's Mojahedin residents of Camp Ashraf and later Camp Liberty. I haven't heard anyone in Washington or the media 
mention these terrorist attacks against innocent men and women who were supposed to be under U.S. protection and U.N. supervision. Maybe we should remind them that every member of the PMOI in Iraq had been interrogated by U.S. law enforcement and intelligence representatives in 2003, and not one person had been guilty of any crime, any act of terrorism, or any action at all against the United States. Maybe we should remind Washington that Soleimani and al mohandis killed well over 100 people carrying protected persons' identity cards issued by the United States of America. And some corrupt elements of the Iraqi military carried out these killings using American weapons that we had given to the state of Iraq. So let us stand with the protesters in Baghdad and the democratic opposition in Syria, including all of those displaced Syrians, and the people of Lebanon. Soleimani is gone. Let us defeat Khomeini's dream of a caliphate once and for all. Now, as I said, Qasem Soleimani wasn't the only regime leader with blood on his hands. Perhaps you've seen threats in recent days from the Supreme Leader's top military advisor, Hossein Degan, who previously was Hassan Rouhani's defense minister for four years. Degan was the young IRGC brigadier who started training Hezbollah, the militia in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley in 1982, and he was the one who oversaw the bombing of the U.S. Marine barracks in Lebanon, killing 220 Marines and 21 other U.S. service members. And what about senior figures like Chief Justice Ebrahim Raisi, or Justice Minister Ali Riza Avayi, or Rouhani's previous Justice Minister, Mustafa Pur Mohammadi? These and other top regime figures should all be facing charges at the International Court of Justice for their role for their role in sending 30,000 political prisoners to their deaths in the summer and fall of 1988. You may have seen Foreign Minister Zarif on television in recent days lecturing Americans on the need to obey international law. I want to know why not one reporter or think tank analyst has asked Mr. Zarif to explain why his embassies in Europe have been used as a secret conduit for terrorist operations over the past two, two years, captured by law enforcement in Denmark, Belgium, France, Germany, Austria, and Albania. We need to stop giving the regime an open channel of propaganda aimed at Washington. It's time that this regime, hardliners, moderates, call them whatever you want, account for all of its crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, four decades of lies, deception, and destructive attacks undermining the rules-based international order is, by Iran is for too many. Four decades of innocent Iranian citizens, men, women, and even teenagers, dragged into prisons, tortured, and executed is for too many. Before he returned to Iran from exile in Paris, Ayatollah Khomeini talked about democracy. He lied. He followed a radical path of violence and intimidation as soon as he reached Iran. The 1979 revolution produced democratic leaders, Prime Minister Bazargan, President Bani Sadr. Both were swept aside by Khomeini, a wave of terror abroad and a reign of terror at home became the new normal for a great nation. The true history has not yet been told. But this much we know now. The Middle East does not want an Iranian-led caliphate, and the Iranian people want to live as a free people. And that is why I am proud to join you in standing for American principles of human rights, women's rights, an independent judiciary with due process under law, free and fair elections, separation of church and state, an end to the death penalty, and a decision 
by the people of Iran that they will not threaten a new arms race by building nuclear weapons. We all know who has stood for this agenda for many years. The PMOI, the National Council of Resistance of Iran, led by Maryam Rajavi, and the great organization of Iranian-American communities. And now we know that the people of Iran are demanding the very same thing. Let us all stand with them. Let us bring forward the truth about the crimes of this regime and appeal for true justice. Let us call on the regime's young functionaries to walk away. Stop shooting and torturing your own brothers and sisters. And let us finally end Iran's nightmare once and for all. Free Iran! Thank you.